I'm Daniel Wolfslegel and welcome to Learn at Home with VIA. Today, I want to talk about a major conspiracy. There are hundreds, potentially thousands of things working together for a common goal here, and none of them ever say a word about it. I'm talking about a very cool concept that's also very complex. I want to talk to you today about ecosystems. So here's some vocabulary we need to know. A keystone species is a species that has a huge impact on its ecosystem, despite small numbers. An ecosystem is a community held together by complex interactions between living and non-living things. Food web is a diagram which tracks the connections between predators and prey. The water cycle is a natural cycle of water from liquid to a gas and back to a liquid. Permeable means that things are allowed to move through it very easily. And an amphibian is a creature that lives on both land and water. So I'm here in northeastern Pennsylvania, so I thought we'd start today by talking a little bit about what's around us. Everywhere I look, I see ponds, streams, creeks, rivers. Now these are all known as freshwater biomes. Freshwater biomes cover one-fifth the surface of planet Earth. And I got thinking, how are these such a stable and clean home for so many different species? Freshwater ecosystems don't contain the same dissolved substances in water as marine ecosystems do. So the animals and plants that live there would not survive in a marine ecosystem. Because freshwater doesn't contain salt, it's more susceptible to freezing and thawing. Freshwater plants and animals have adapted to survive this process. They also have respiratory structures adapted specifically for freshwater and have evolved reproductive and feeding behaviors that enable them to survive successfully in their environment. Now, you may not realize it, but the water you're drinking today has been around for a very, very long time. See, water isn't often created or destroyed, it just gets recycled by the most amazing recycling plant I know, planet Earth. Now that means you're technically sharing the same water that a dinosaur drank. So what is a water cycle? Now a water cycle describes how water leaves the surface of the Earth and goes up, usually as steam. So it turns into a gas or evaporates and makes its way up into the sky. And then it starts coming back together, or condensates, in these giant pockets of water vapor that you know as clouds. Eventually, it becomes a little bit too heavy and starts to fall back to Earth. And this is precipitation, so they can come in many forms. So it could be rain, or sleet, or hail, or snow, or any form of water that's falling from the sky. And it lands here on Earth and runs down, starts to collect together in what's called runoff. And this makes its way into streams and rivers. So now we have fresh, clean water making its way all the way out eventually into the oceans. So one experiment that you could do at home is you could take a couple stones from your yard and you could take a plastic water bottle from your recycling. Put the stones in the bottom and they're gonna hold some of the water. Then you put a little dirt on top and take a clump of grass with some roots on it, right? You wanna make sure that you get the roots so that this grass can stay alive. Put it inside the bottle and add a little bit of water. Just a little bit, you don't need a lot. This is gonna essentially make its own water cycle. It's what's called a terrarium. Take the top of your plastic bottle and stick it back in upside down and that'll hold some of that water in place. So you can see it's already starting to warm up and create gas. And that essentially makes clouds inside your terrarium. So what we're talking about is runoff. You've probably noticed that when rain falls, it doesn't just fall straight down. Now, it hits mountains, and it hits your yard and the side of your house, and then it runs down and it's collected in streams and ponds. And those things then travel further down, and they start filling up your rivers. So this is why after it rains, it may take a day or two, and then your river's overflowing. Now, runoff is not a bad thing. In fact, 70% of all of our crops are irrigated with runoff water. It's really just one way to move water from one place to another. Where this becomes a problem is if it's picking up chemicals or waste in your yard. Maybe it picks up things on your street. If it picks up pesticides from your garden or your lawn, perhaps, and runs it downstream into a pond, that could kill off all of the algae. And that is a big problem. Now this could cause huge devastation to the pond's food chain or food web. One of the basic food supplies that the whole ecosystem depends on would be gone. 
Now, freshwater biomes have huge food chains or food webs, and it's believed that more than 700 species of fish, 1,200 species of amphibians, mollusks, and insects all live in these areas. Every part of a food chain is important. So let's start at the bottom, way down with the bacteria. It's called cyanobacteria, and it's the blue-green algae that you find in most freshwater biomes. Now, there are many animals that depend on this to feed, and if they're gonna survive in such an environment, they're gonna need their food. Flies and water fleas wouldn't be able to exist without that algae. So you may be saying, well, who cares? They're pests, right? Quite frankly, you don't need to be annoyed while you're enjoying the water. But they do provide a massive amount of food for birds, amphibians, and many other living things in the freshwater biome. What many experts have noted is that there are very few types of plants that can't grow well in freshwater biome. Now, it's also important to note that freshwater biome has the second largest diversity among plants and animals. Now, this makes it both really cool to explore and a vital benefit to the Earth as a whole. And there are many ways that a food chain can be disrupted. With so many things that depend on one another in order to survive, taking out a piece is kind of like taking out the bricks from the foundation of a building. And if there's enough impact, the entire system could collapse. So this is called a keystone species. So a keystone is the part of a brick archway that supports all the weight. If you take that out, the whole thing crumbles. Where could we find such an important species that everything else would depend on? The answer might just hop in front of you. When we're looking at the health of an ecosystem, we often look to our amphibian friends, so our salamanders and our frogs. According to the Global Amphibian Assessment of 2004, we found that 42% of all amphibians are either endangered or suffering. They're almost extinct. Uh, this study did take place in Southeast Asia where deforestation is a big problem. But there's a lot of different reasons that our friends here serve as an important part of our ecosystem. So when they're small, they can serve as food for other things like fish. They're an impor important part of the food chain. Uh, as they get larger, they start to feed on things like algae and even our frog friends, when they become full-grown adults, they help keep some of our more troubling species in check, such as mosquitoes. And now, it's time to take a break with Random Trivia. Jumpstart that brain and get your blood pumping, because here we go. Dan, what do you have for us this week? So I thought a lot about what to do this week for Random Trivia. And I came across a lot of different numbers on how long species live. And it got me thinking, well, what species lives the shortest amount of time? So here's your question for today. Which species has the shortest lifespan? Is it A, the panther chameleon? B, the dragonfly? C, the drone ant? D, the house mouse? Or E, the mayfly? Take a second and think about this. What do you know about these things? Do you have an answer? All right, let's check it out. First up, we have the panther chameleon. While it's known for its ability to change color and blend into its environment, most people are no stranger to the chameleon. It's a fan favorite, but did you know that panther chameleons only have a lifespan of one year? In fact, panther chameleons have the shortest lifespan among reptiles in the chameleon family. Panther chameleons are native to northern and eastern parts of Madagascar. They show rapid mating behavior because of their short lifespan. Interestingly, the entire generation of adult chameleons disappear before the next generation emerges from its eggs. So while that's certainly a memorable fact, it doesn't mean the chameleon has the shortest lifespan. Sorry. Up next, we have the dragonfly. Now this is an absolute summer favorite. Anytime I'm near water, like a pond or a stream, dragonflies are one of my favorite insects. And they're such amazing flyers. We even based our helicopters after them. It's true. Now there's 5,000 different species of dragonflies in the world, and it's a good thing there's so many because the maximum lifespan of a dragonfly is only about four months. But most of the dragonflies won't even live that long because it takes a while once they leave larva stage to be able to fly. So they're quickly eaten by spiders, birds, lizards, and frogs. They don't last long, but not the shortest lifespan. Up next, drone ants. Lazy and with little purpose to their life, drone ants are the male members of an ant colony. Most people think they're out collecting food all day and working hard. I mean, ants are some of the strongest living things and leaf cutter ants can lift 50 times their body weight. So if you're a hundred pound person, you can walk around carrying a rhinoceros or a small car. Though strong, drone ants only have a life cycle of three weeks and it's the females that establish the ant colonies. 
Drone ants are primarily for continuing the species, and once they've mated, they pretty much die. Crazy story, but not the shortest lifespan. Next, the house mouse. Little, furry, and either cute or terrifying depending on your phobias, the mouse seems like it would live for a long time. But the common house mouse only has a lifespan of about a year. So by the time they're full grown, there isn't much time left before passing the torch for creatures most likely to make mom shriek from a chair in the next generation. So by process of elimination, we know what it's not. That means the only thing left is the mayfly. Mayflies have the shortest lifespan on earth. Their average life lasts for only 24 hours. That's it, one day. In fact, they're often called one day insects because of their lifespan. There are 2,500 different species of mayflies in the world. In fact, some members of the mayfly family die within as few as a couple of hours. Now, mayflies spend most of their lifetime in the nymph stage and become adults just before death. The only purpose of mayflies is reproduction and to be food. So what does a species do with only a few hours of life? They dance. Mayflies form groups and dance together on pretty much any available surface. And it may seem annoying to be overrun with a massive swarm of mayflies, but remember, they're living life to the fullest. And now you know. Mayfly, you have the shortest lifespan. Very nice, very nice. I learned something. And now, back to the show. The importance of frogs and amphibians in the natural world cannot be underestimated. And throughout their life cycle, they play a significant role in the food chain as both a predator and prey. Frogs go through several stages in their life cycle, and each cycle, frogs are a crucial part of the food chain. Specifically, when they're eggs, frogs provide food for spiders and wasps. When they become tadpoles, then they're food for other things like dragonfly nymphs. As they mature, they feed on algae, which helps filter and keep our water supplies clean, and they keep our mosquito factories in check. Full-grown frogs feed on insects such as moths, grasshoppers, flies, crickets, mosquitoes, and spiders all while they provide valuable food for things like birds and lizards, snakes, even monkeys in some places. Indeed, frogs help keep insects from wreaking havoc on crops. For example, in the 1980s, India exported large amounts of frogs to France as food. This led to the population of frogs to drop dramatically. As the frog population dropped, the insect population exploded, and that decimated all of their crops and fields. So realizing how crucial frogs were to a healthy ecosystem, the Indian government finally banned the export of frogs. Now frogs also help keep insects from spreading diseases, such as Zika, malaria, even dengue. Adult frogs eat mosquitoes and help keep the insect population under control. More importantly, tadpoles also eat many insect larvae that make their homes in pools, puddles, ditches, and swamps, and other places that are really stagnant water. Now, in places where we've lost amphibians, we immediately notice the ecosystem changing. Other animals begin starving to death and waterways clogging up from all the algae. Nothing really steps in to fill the role of frogs. According to Dr. Ann Raleigh of the University of New South Wales Center for Ecosystem Science, frogs are also an amazing indicator species. That means they're a go-to for scientists wanting to find out more about environmental health of a particular ecosystem. Now, frogs are amphibians. In Greek, the word amphibian literally translates to two lives. And this is because they have permeable skin, and that means that water and oxygen can both travel freely through their skin. And because of this, they're very sensitive to pollutants. And because they can live on both land and in the water, they're a good indicator of the health of both environments. So a food web is a way to track the connections that predators and prey have in an ecosystem. And you think that a food web is pretty straightforward. In fact, we used to refer to them as a chain, which started as one link and then moved up in a straight line. But it's much more complicated than that. For us, plants make food from sunshine, and then animals eat plants, and then we eat animals. And usually nothing eats us, so we consider ourselves the top of the food chain. But is that true? If we look at the diagram, a freshwater food chain, you see that it intertwines. This is why we call it a food web, because it's much more like a spider web. You see, things don't just feed on or act as food for one thing, for example. Animal plankton feed on water bugs and shrimp and small fish, but they themselves eat algae and plankton. What's interesting to note is that it all begins with the sun feeding the algae and plant life. In a way, everything we eat is processed sunshine. But if we go to the top, we don't see fishermen, we see things like fungi and bacteria, which in turn break things down to become usable nutrients for plant life again. The Lion King had it right all the way. It's a circle or a web. 
Either way, it's a lot more complicated than we initially thought. Good morning, Mr. Kozer. Could you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Hello, my name is Scott Kozer. I work for a conservation district and I also happen to be a farmer. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about how farmers can reduce runoff and some of the negative impacts from that. If you look behind me, you'll see a field of what we call cover crops. And how does a cover crop provide all of those benefits? Cover crops are crops that are planted in between cash crops, cash crops like corn, soybeans, wheat, and they provide benefits while those crops are not growing. In this case, they're reducing runoff two ways. They're providing a physical barrier for when we get heavy rains that would normally come in contact with the soil and wash soil away. They're providing that barrier. And the other thing they're doing, if we look a little bit below ground, is that the roots are physically holding on to the soil. They're intertwined with the soil and so that reduces sedimentation from erosion too. Why don't we want the sediment moving? Isn't that just dirt? So we don't want to see that in our freshwater ecosystems because when that sediment, when that soil leaves the field and goes into our streams, lakes, ponds, it'll fill in the habitat spaces, pore spaces for fish and aquatic organisms salamanders and it degrades their habitat and it degrades the water quality. So what else is a cover crop good for? Another thing this cover crop is doing is that it's holding on to nutrients. It's cycling nutrients, uh, fertilizers, manure, anything that was put on this field, keeping that from running off. And if we look close here, we'll see another benefit and that's pollinator habitat. And what are you planting there? The one your eye goes to right away is this yellow flower. That's actually a turnip. So when do you typically plant your cover crop? This cover crop mix was planted uh, in early fall, late summer of last year after a crop of rye. Another species in this cover crop mix is clover. This is actually crimson clover. If you look close, you'll see the crimson flower. And this species here is called vetch, the spindly plant. And vetch and clovers are really cool species of plants. They're in the legume family, and they have the ability to fix nitrogen in the atmosphere, nitrogen in the air that we breathe, and put it into the soil. And how does nitrogen help farmers? That helps farmers because we can reduce our fertilizer costs when we utilize nutrients that are already there. So what would you say is the big takeaway on how runoff can impact our water? Cover crops provide a lot of other benefits too. They increase the soil organic matter, which reduces fertilizer costs in itself. They help infiltrate water. A lot of people think that maybe here in Pennsylvania, we don't have a runoff problem, that maybe we have more of an infiltration problem. And that if we got more water to go through the soil profile, they would have a lot less runoff and they would have more water, clean water going into the groundwater. Well, thank you, Mr. Kozer, and keep up the good work. So I hope you learn a little bit about cover crops today and some of the practices that farmers can put in place to reduce runoff and the amount of nutrients and sediment that leave that could potentially be impacts, negative impacts to our freshwater ecosystems. Now, there are a couple risk factors that are very, very serious threats to the freshwater biomes. The first has to do with pollution. Different types of pollution can make it into the air and make it hard for animals to thrive or plants to grow like they should. Pollution due to human waste and chemical runoff are also a problem in most areas. Global warming is a concern for freshwater biomes as well. The level of water in them can make a huge difference when it comes to what's able to thrive there. And many of these locations with small levels of water completely dry up. Others are at risk of doing so in the very near future. Many have drastically less water than they did just 10 years ago. Okay, so here's an experiment that you can do at home. There are a lot of different ways to test your water. One of the ways is to actually buy yourself a water testing kit. We're gonna test some water here in just a minute. A simple way that you could work with your water though is to simply take some of your water at home and smell it. Water has some different scents to it that'll be able to tell you a little bit about it. For example, if it has a bleach smell, this likely comes from the chlorine in your local treatment plant. And while that's not a great smell, it's not enough to really hurt you. It could have a rotten egg smell, and that's what's often referred to as sulfur. And again, that comes from some bacteria that should be growing around your, your pipes or your water source. 
probably not something that's gonna hurt you, but it's not a pleasant smell. If it has a musty or earthy smell, that's from organic material in your water supply or in your pipes, and that's something you may wanna get checked out. But if we wanted to test some water, what we would do is take a basic strip like this. There's a testing strip, and then there's a reference chart on the back of our testing strip. And we're gonna test a couple things today. So I'm gonna take my stream water first. I take my water strip and I put it in and I mix it around. And I wanna mix it around here, get it good and soaked so it has a good sample of the water. I'm gonna leave it for about 20 seconds. Let's test a couple other things. This is filtered water from a refrigerator filter. And the last one we're gonna test is a regular bottled water. So this is any of the generic bottled water that you could buy in a store. So out of all three, what we found, looking at our variations in colors, there really was not a huge amount of difference between our regular stream water and the bottled water that you can buy in a store. They're almost identical. We did have a little bit better quality on our refrigerator filter. It just goes to show you that you may not want to spend your money on all that fancy bottled water. Bottled water is a huge concern because it's so much plastic that created by the empty bottles, it ends up in the freshwater biome. But do we really need to care? We'll take our frog friends, for example. Researchers have found that frogs are important for tons of medical reasons. In fact, scientists have found over 200 helpful substances in amphibian skin. One of these can be used as a painkiller. It's 200 times stronger than morphine and without any addictive qualities. Frog skin secretions can also be used as an antibiotic, and some frogs can help heal cuts and bruises and even heal organs after surgery. And that's not the craziest thing. Frog substances can also provide treatment for heart attacks, depression, strokes, seizures, Alzheimer's, and even cancer. In Australia, the red-eyed tree frog and its relatives can even produce compounds that scientists believe can prevent HIV. That would seem worth keeping around to me. So what can we do? There are some small changes you can make at home that can have a huge impact. For example, reducing or eliminating the use of household chemicals and pesticides. So these are dangerous chemicals that when used properly can still have a big impact on the environment. Harsh chemicals in a lot of your store-bought cleaners can get into the water supply and leak into the ecosystems when you get rid of them or send them down your drain. You can make your own cleaning solutions with some distilled vinegar and baking soda or purchase green cleaning products, brands such as 7th Generation or Clorox Greenworks. They make their cleaning products with chemicals that are a bit more environmentally friendly than your conventional cleaners. Finally, reducing your waste is one of the best ways you can help the environment. So it can be a difficult thing keeping an ecosystem in check. Let's take, for example, deforestation. Now, we know that cutting down all the trees is a bad thing, but a lot of people's jobs and livelihoods depend on clear-cutting forests. So it could be anything from needing papers and hardwoods to clearing out sections for beef to graze. Maybe even clear-cutting something for a solar farm. Rather than using disposable paper towels, use reusable towels that could be washed rather than thrown away. And use reusable containers, not disposable. Basically, try to lessen the amount of trash you make. Finally, choose foods that are locally grown and grown sustainably. Now, some parts of our food system require food to be shipped all over the country and internationally, and large farms usually require a lot of pesticides, but local foods may not need to be transported far. Organically grown food is also more sustainable because it doesn't use pesticides. Your local farmer's market is one of the best ways to find locally grown, affordable, and often organically grown food. So what did we learn today? We learned that the water cycle has been around for a really long time. We learned that ecosystems are very complex and usually better thought of as a web. We learned that frogs and salamanders serve as a very good keystone species because they can breathe through their skin. And we learned that what you do at home can have a huge impact on ecosystems around the world. Thank you for coming along in this journey with me, and thank you for learning at home with VIA.